is Revelations, Star Wars, the battle behind the throne. Tonight we're going to sweep aside the curtain and see a cosmic conflict, a titanic struggle between good and evil. We live in the Los Angeles basin here. Our meetings are being satellited from the Sequoia Conference Center, the border of Los Angeles County, but in the heart of Orange County. There's one thing about being from this area, and that is that many people come to Orange County, they come to the Los Angeles basin because they want to make it big in TV. They have dreams of being stars, playing the lead role in feature films. Yet there is something surprising that's taking place in the film industry. Angels are taking a leading role. Angels are making a comeback today, both in the film industry and throughout American society. You remember that movie not long ago? Angels in the Outfield. Who starred? Angels starred. Angels are the stars of movies. Angels are the stars of books. Here's a book, Angels, Miracles and Messages. Life Magazine ran a cover feature article titled, The Trail of Angels. Billy Graham wrote a book, What About Angels? Another book, The Millennium of Deception, Angelic Deception Between the Forces of Light and the Forces of Darkness. Angels indeed are making a comeback. People seem fascinated by angels today. Guardian angels, good angels, evil angels. Go into any little gift shop and you'll notice there are angel pins, angel brooches, angel statues, angel icons. It seems that we're fascinated with angels. There's that famous blockbuster miniseries on CBS that's now running called what? Touched by an angel. Yes, interest in angels is exploding. Frank Peretti, a Christian author, wrote a book that really rocked the Christian world called The Present Darkness Piercing the Darkness. It was the story about a little town in which a family of four or five were the major characters. In this town, there was a battle between good and evil, the angels of light and the angels of darkness over this family. The book tells chapter by chapter how the father, mother, sisters and brothers would every day have to face choices. And as they did, they'd be influenced by the forces of light and the forces of darkness. The book is a bestseller. Thousands, millions of copies sold. Angels really have caught the attention of men and women throughout the United States and Canada. The book of Revelation is a book about angels. Angels play a prominent part in the book of Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, angels bring messages to the seven churches representing God's people and the struggles they go through in every age of earth's history. In the book of Revelation, angels seem to be flying from heaven to earth with God's last day message. Revelation 10, there is one angel that comes down from the glory of God in heaven, puts one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, and raises his hand and says there'll be time no longer. Angels in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, four angels hold back winds of strife. In Revelation 7 it says there's trouble coming from the north, trouble coming from the south, trouble coming from the east and the west, and angels stand there and hold back the winds of strife and destruction. In Revelation chapter 14, angels, three of them, fly swiftly to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Their message leaps across language barriers. It penetrates every corner of the earth. It leaps across geographical boundaries and the three angels of the book of Revelation bring their message, God's message, to the ends of the earth in end time. 
Yes, angels play an important part in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, more than in any other book in the Bible, Revelation reveals an angelic struggle between good and evil. Revelation takes us back, back through the eons of time. Revelation takes us back into the ages of eternity. Revelation takes us back to the throne of God. And there at the throne of God in the book of Revelation, there is a titanic struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Revelation leads us back before creation, the creation of earth. It leads us back before the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars. It leads us back before the creation of the planetary heavens. It leads us back to the beginning when God created angels, and then it describes, as time goes on, a titanic struggle between good, ev good and evil angels. It describes a Star Wars conflict, a cosmic conflict between good and evil. The reason why there is war on earth is because there was once war in heaven. The reason why there is conflict on earth is because there was once conflict in heaven. And unless you understand this battle, this struggle, this conflict between angelic beings, you can never really make sense out of life, and you can never make sense on what's going on around you unless you first understand what went on above you. You can never understand why there isn't peace on earth unless you understand why there was war in heaven. The Bible describes this amazing struggle, this incredible battle in the Revelation. Now this revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whose revelation is it again, everybody? It's the revelation of who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus. And Jesus gives us a magnificent revelation of a battle that began in heaven millenniums ago. Revelation, the 12th chapter and the 7th verse says, and war, read it with me please, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And war broke out where? Where did war break out, folks? Isn't that a strange place for war? You wouldn't think that war would break out in heaven. And two sides, two opposing sides, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. The word Michael, the last two letters, L. You know, every time you see in the Bible a word with those last two letters, L, or the prefix L, Elohim, meaning God. So Michael means one who is like God. The one who is like God. The one next to the Father. Christ himself. That almighty, powerful being, the commander-in-chief of the angels, has a battle with the dragon and the dragon's angels, and they fight. And the Bible continues there as it goes on. But they, that is the evil angels, did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. The battle between Christ and Satan in heaven results in Satan being cast out of heaven. So the great dragon... Revelation 12, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Now, who is the dragon? Who is that? Satan. The Bible calls Satan a dragon and a serpent. He's the dragon because he destroys. He's the serpent because he deceives. He deceives you to destroy you, and he destroys those whom he has deceived. So the Bible takes the curtain and sweeps it aside. The Bible allows us to view into eternity. And as we stand there, looking, gazing into eternity, gazing thousands of years back, we see a struggle, we see a battle, we see a conflict between Christ and Satan in heaven. We see the powers of light and the powers of darkness in battle. We see good and evil angels in war. And the Bible says, Revelation 12, 9, Satan was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. A battle, a struggle, a Star Wars conflict. 
greater than any conflict that could be imagined on earth. Now, let me again draw your attention to this fact. You can never understand what's going on on earth until you see this conflict that went on in heaven. You can never understand the book of Revelation and the final conflict between Christ and Satan on earth and the battle of the dragon against God's people on earth unless you understand the battle of the dragon against Christ and the angels in heaven. You can never understand all those issues of the mark of the beast, the mysterious number 666, the United States in prophecy, this whole issue of a consolidation of evil religious forces taken over by Satan who try to destroy God's people. You can't understand that until you really understand something of the larger dimensions of this conflict between good and evil. But yet, Revelation 12 raises some questions. Why was there war in heaven? And where did this dragon come from? I mean, if God is God, and if God is a God of love, and if God is a God of compassion and kindness and goodness, and if God only wants joy for the universe, why in the world did God create a dragon or Satan up in heaven? Did God create Satan? Now, you can't understand the book of Revelation unless you have some idea of the themes in the Bible that prepare you to understand the book of Revelation. 404 verses in the Old Testament are quoted in the book of Revelation. You see, let's suppose you're reading any book. Leave the Bible aside for a moment. You're reading any book, and you read the last chapter in the drama. If you haven't read chapter 1 or chapter 3 or chapter 7 or chapter 12, you really won't understand the conclusion of the book. Many Christians take the book of Revelation, they jump right into it without a background in the rest of the Bible. Is it any surprise why so many of these Christians get confused? Sometimes in my meetings I have people say to me, well, well Mark, I want to go right into Revelation and only study it. And my answer is, you cannot understand Revelation unless you understand the themes in the Bible that contribute to revealing the meaning of the book of Revelation. So let's digress tonight for a moment from the battle in heaven and this dragon and try to discover how this being Lucifer, the devil, Satan, ever got up in heaven in the first place. Did God create a demon and put him in heaven? What are the real issues in this conflict between good and evil? And how do these issues impact our life living on the verge of eternity. We first begin our search in the book of Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel lived at the same time as the prophet Daniel. And Ezekiel and Daniel wrote together great, amazing, magnificent prophecies. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12 says, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. He is speaking about Lucifer. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now here in this Bible passage, Ezekiel talks about a man called the king of Tyre who represented evil or wickedness or Lucifer. And he says, Lucifer, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. You were perfect in beauty. He goes on as he describes him and says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. So Lucifer was an anointed cherub or angel. The Bible's angel stories are more fascinating than any angel drama depicted on national television today or any novel written by angels. This Star Wars conflict in heaven began in the far reaches of space millenniums ago. And there was an anointed angel full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. God created not a demon, God created not a devil, but a perfect angel. That angel was wise and bright and intelligent. And that angel, according to the Bible, 
was an anointed cherub. He was next to the throne of God. He revealed the very glory of God. It says in Ezekiel 28 verse 14 about Lucifer, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. This angel walked in the very fiery presence of God. This angel walked amidst the glory of God. This angel walked right into the throne room of God. This angel was an anointed cherub. And this angel ultimately, finally, completely betrayed God. Can you imagine it? A being created by God, a, be, a being that God says, Ezekiel 28, verse 15, you were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created till iniquity, that is sin or rebellion or lawlessness, was found in you. No, ladies and gentlemen, God did not create a demon. God did not create a dragon. God did not create a flaw in the consciousness of this angel. God created a perfect angel, an angel that was next to his throne, an angel that revealed his glory, but an angel that consciously chose to rebel against God. You see, you might ask, why would God even make it possible for an angel to rebel? I mean, why didn't God just kind of fix something in his head? Why didn't God just uh, put something in his brain so he'd never rebel? Because God is a God of love. And love longs to have creatures respond back to him in love. And love can never be forced. Love can never be coerced. Love can never be pressured. Love only can come from hearts that love because they are loved. God didn't want some marionette, angels walking heaven. God pulls a little string. Beep, 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 beep. The marionettes, you know, do you think God wants marionettes up there? No. God wants the worship of intelligent angels. But if you give an angel the capacity to choose and you put him even in an atmosphere of love, that angel has the capacity to make a choice contrary to God. So strange feelings began developing in the heart of Lucifer. Strange feelings began welling up inside his heart and his mind and the citadel of his soul, the prophet Ezekiel. Describes it this way, Ezekiel 28 verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. Who corrupted his wisdom? Did God do it? Not on your life, friend. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Pride began to replace love. Egotism began to replace unselfishness. Self-centeredness began to replace service. And Lucifer, deep within his heart, began to think strange thoughts. God is not fair. God is not just. God doesn't have the happiness of his creatures in view. God is not a God of love. This Lucifer began to think. Isaiah the prophet describes the thoughts that went on in this fallen angel's heart. Isaiah 14 verse 12, how are you, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, the word Lucifer comes from two Latin words, lux, the first part, and pharaoh, the last part. It means light bearer. Lucifer was a great light bearer. He was an anointed angel, an anointed cherub. He was next to the throne of God. He had a place of prominence in heaven. He had a place of prominence in all eternity. He stood out from all the other angels as a glorious being. How are you fallen from heaven, O light bearer, the sun of the morning? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. A battle for the throne, more exciting than any TV drama, more exciting than any cheap fictitious novel, more exciting than any cosmic conflict that human beings can dream up in Star Trek or Star Wars or Star anything else. 
Here, the scripture says, is the great battle of the ages, Christ and Satan. I will exalt my throne, Satan says, in the far reaches of eternity. Thousands of years ago, Lucifer wants to exalt his throne above the stars of God. As Isaiah 14, verse 13, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. What does that mean? Every Jew knew what that meant. Isaiah was a Jew. What was the Mount of Congregation? The Jews were camped in Sinai Peninsula. Mount Sinai was north of the camp from where they camped. The Mount of Congregation was the mount that God echoed the law from. So when Lucifer says, I will be on the Mount of Congregation, he's saying, I'm going to give the law. He is saying, I am not going to obey. He is challenging the authority of God. He's saying, my authority is superior to God's authority. Isaiah 14, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer really wanted three things. He first wanted to have a position that was higher than his current position. He was not content in the position that God gave him. Secondly, Lucifer desired an exalted throne. He would not be happy unless he ruled. His was the way of selfishness. His was the way of greed. His was the way of self-seeking. His was the way of egotism. And thirdly, Lucifer desired rulership and dominance. He could not be happy unless he dominated. Now there is a law that governs the entire universe that God created. And it is the law of love. Because love is the answer to the heart's rebellion. When God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the councils of eternity met, they loved so much. They experienced so much happiness in the unity and harmony of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. They said, let us bring forth creatures that can enjoy the love that's in the universe. Let us create angels. Let us create seraphims and cherubims. Let us create beings on planets afar. Let us create earth with earth beings and let them bask in the sunshine of love. Let them enjoy happiness and joy forever and ever and ever because love is the foundation of all the universe the very nature of God is love first John 4 verse 7 says read it with me please love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God first John chapter 4 and verse 10 reading together this is love not that we loved God but that he, he loved us. And then that classic text that defines who God is and what God's character is all about. 1 John 4, 8, three words, what are they? God is love. So God's love was challenged. Lucifer, before all of the heavenly beings, said, God does not love you. And when you challenge God's love, you challenge the essence of the universe. You challenge the foundation of the very universe. Because love is the foundation of God's government. So a rebel angel arises and he says, If I were ruling, if I sat upon the throne, I could do a better God than God could. God's love is restrictive. God's love is arbitrary. He challenged the very heart of God's government. Ezekiel 28, 6 says, You have set your heart as the heart of a God. Lucifer, a created being, questioned God's authority. God, why do you reign? God, who, who gives you the authority to be on the throne? Lucifer also questioned God's fairness. Lucifer began to sow lies. God doesn't love us. God doesn't have our best interest in view. God doesn't desire our happiness. God, the God that sits on the throne, the God that sits there in his glory, 
This God is not worthy to rule. He's not a God of love. And Lucifer began lying. And can you imagine that? First, these feelings were strange in the heart of Lucifer. First, he was amazed himself as he began to think these thoughts. Why didn't God, this God that sits upon the throne, this God of glory that has the power to destroy Lucifer, why didn't he just take his hand and swat Lucifer like a bug or like a mosquito and kill him? Why would God allow Lucifer to go on? Lucifer challenged God's government. Lucifer said, God, you're not fair. God, you're not just. God, you don't really love us. Lucifer challenged the foundation of God's government and said, God, prove your love. You don't love us. God, I love these angels more than you do. I'll have a greater plan for them. I want to rule. I want to reign, and they'll be happier under my government. Why didn't God just destroy Lucifer? Let's suppose that the mayor of Los Angeles was challenged by one of his council members. And this council member was very prominent in L.A. government. And let's suppose that this council member challenged the way the mayor of Los Angeles administrated the government of Los Angeles. And let's suppose that this council member had some support on the city council. And let's suppose he was saying, the mayor is unfair, he's unjust, the mayor is padding his own pockets with money, the mayor is just wanting people to serve him, he's a dictator, he's harsh, he doesn't have the citizen's best interest in view. Does the mayor have the authority and political clout and power to call out the SWAT team? He sure does. Could the mayor then just say to the SWAT team, go out and do away with that city councilman, Brrr, ruin him, shoot him, kill him, get rid of him? Now what if the mayor calls out the city council SWAT, and what if he calls out the SWAT team and kills this city councilman and his followers? That would prove the mayor was right, wouldn't it? And it would prove that all the charges from the city councilman were false. Would it? If the mayor uses his power to destroy his rival, it would apparently justify the claims of his rival. God had the power to destroy Lucifer, but God's character had been challenged in the universe. His character of love. Lucifer, that demonic being, saw God as a rival. And Lucifer said that his government, his way of life, was far superior to God's, that it was a way of abandonment and no restraint at all, that it could be a way of happiness. Lucifer challenged God's government. How would God face Lucifer's challenge? The only way God could face Lucifer's challenge is to demonstrate his love in the whole universe, in dramatic ways, there was a war in heaven. And as that war pursued, Revelation 12, verse 9, so the great dragon, who's the great dragon? Satan, was cast out. Cast out of where, everybody? Heaven. That serpent, who's the serpent? The deceiver, Satan, of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. What is Satan's great deception? Satan's great deception is that it is greater joy to turn your back on God than it is to serve God. Satan's great deception is, is that God doesn't love you, that he hedges you in with restrictions and rules that aren't for your best good. Every principle, every commandment that God has given us is based on his character of love and is for our best good. Lucifer is a deceiver, and he deceives us to destroy us. Lucifer was cast out of heaven, and his angels were cast out with him. But wait a minute, that leads us to another question. And that other question focuses on this. How did planet Earth become involved in this cosmic conflict? Did God create Earth as a dumping off place for Satan? Did God create Earth just because he wanted to get rid of this rival? Did God create Earth just because he wanted to get rid of this demonic being that caused him so many problems in heaven? Not on your life. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31 that God looked out over the Earth and it was perfect. 
babbling brooks with crystal clear water, earth carpeted with living grain, fantastic mountains, fantastic hills with flowers dotting those hills and dotting that landscape, fruits and abundance, and great amounts of adequate food. It was just a fantastic world that God created. It was a world that was perfect, filled with love and joy and peace and happiness and long-suffering. It was a world that was filled with gentleness and meekness and kindness. It was a world that was filled with love. When God created Adam and Eve, they walked hand in hand through that garden. They watched as magnificent, beautiful sunsets painted the sky with the red crimsons as if with the master artist brush. They looked at magnificent flowers and fields of waving grain and daisies and poppies and daffodils and tulips and they dangled their feet in crystal clear water and picked fantastic fruit that was so crisp and succulent and grapes and bananas and pineapples. What a world that it was. God did not create this world as a dumping off place for Satan. But would God be fair? Would God really answer Satan's challenge? If God restricted Adam and Eve from making a choice, could not Satan say to the whole universe, if Adam and Eve had the opportunity to choose God, they would choose me. God, you're afraid. The only weapon God had was the weapon of love. Satan had the weapon of deception. Satan had the weapon of lying. God placed Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden. God created Adam and Eve in his own image. God put Adam and Eve in the center of an environment of perfect love. And God depended on love to win the day. Satan came to that garden. And Satan began to sow his lies. He said to Eve, Eve, does God really love you? Eve. Does God really care? He insinuated doubt, Genesis 3, verse 4. He said, Eve, eat of the tree. You will not die. God says that sin brings death. God says that separation from him brings death. God said rebellion destroys you. God says selfishness destroys you. God says that following your own self-gratifications destroys you. But it doesn't, Eve. It gives you happiness. It gives you joy. Eve, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Genesis 3, verse 5, Satan said, Eve, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God doesn't love you, Eve. Eve, reach out and take it. Eve, you will have a greater experience of knowledge and joy and you will feel exhilaration flowing through your body. And Adam and Eve listened to the voice of the evil one and mistrusted God and partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Soon, dark shadows covered a garden called Eden. They were separated from God, and sorrow replaced joy, and hate replaced self-sacrificing service, and bitterness replaced love, and envy replaced kindness. And soon Adam and Eve, separated from God, entered into a world, a world that was filled with pain and suffering. Because sin always brings disaster, sin, al sin always brings death, and ours was a planet in rebellion. Ours was a planet separated from God. Ours was a planet that turned its back on God. And the cosmic conflict that was in the universe with good and evil angels waging back and forth now focused on a planet. Satan came knocking on the door of a planet called Earth. And Adam and Eve opened that door. And Satan rushed through that door. Why is it today that there is sickness and suffering and death on a planet called Earth? Because ours is a planet in rebellion. Ours is a planet that turned its back on God. Ours is a planet 
of sorrow and heartache and disappointment because men and women have turned their back on God. And the whole universe sees that this earth was better off in Eden in the atmosphere of love that God created it in. Satan challenged God and he said to God, your way is not right. Before the universe, Satan said, if creatures follow me and they have no restraints, no, nothing to bind them, God binds you. God's rules are too arbitrary. Satan said, follow me. And when men and women began to follow him, that which followed in the train and wake of sin was sorrow and death and the coffin and the grave. And so sin produces anxiety and fear and worry and loneliness and discouragement and suffering and sorrow. And ultimately, sin produces death. So in our world today, the question is, who is responsible for the famines? Who is responsible for children being born with deformities? Who is responsible for sickness and suffering and death? Who is responsible? Is God? Not one bit of it. God created a perfect world and a perfect planet. And God created a garden called Eden. And Adam and Eve walked hand in hand in love and in joy and happiness. You know, one day the disciples came to Jesus. And when they came, they asked Jesus the question, Jesus, why is there so much suffering in the world? And Jesus told a story. He said there was a man that went out to sow. And he sowed good seed in his field. But then later, tares came up. And he said, God is like that sower. He only sows good seed. Matthew, the 13th chapter and 27th verse. Somebody comes to the farmer who sowed the good seed and says, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? God, didn't you sow only joy and happiness when you planted the Garden of Eden? God, didn't you plant the seeds of health? Didn't you plant the seeds of vibrant life? Didn't you plant the seeds, God, of absolute incredible loving happiness and kindness and compassion? Didn't you put only good things in the Garden of Eden? Didn't you create earth perfect? God, then, where do all these weeds come from? Where does the weed of cancer come from? Where does the weed of heart disease come from? Where does the weed of diabetes come from? Where does the weed of bitterness and anger and resentment come from? The weed of war, the weed of selfishness, the weed of dominance. Where does all that come from? And Jesus answered that question to his disciples Matthew 13, verse 28, read it with me, please. He said to them, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. An enemy is responsible for the sickness and the suffering and the heartache and the sorrow in our world. But wait, wait. Ours is a planet in rebellion against God. Ours is a planet in which our first parents turned their back on God. Ours is a planet in which they opened the door there are two ways in the universe, the way of love and the way of selfishness. And Adam and Eve mistrusted God and they went the way of selfishness and it plunged the whole planet into the rebellion of sin and death. And men and women in every generation have been following that way of selfishness rather than that way of love. And God's trying to get our attention, telling us that the way of love is the way of life for the whole universe. How would God reveal that love? What would God do to show the whole universe his love? How could God win back this planet in rebellion? He couldn't use force. He wouldn't use convert, coercion. He wouldn't use power. He wouldn't use pressure. He wouldn't use deception. God had only one weapon, and that was the weapon of love. And so there, in a garden called Eden, come back with me thousands of years over the millenniums of time and find God's garden promise. Because there in that promise, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, when Adam and Eve ran from God, when Adam and Eve turned their backs on God, God came into that garden. And with tones of tenderest love and in compassion, he said, Adam, Adam, where are you, Adam? 
I want to tell you my way of love. Adam, you have opened a door for earth that can never be shut. You have plunged the human race into sin and rebellion. But, Adam, I will interrupt history and love will come down. Genesis, the third chapter, is the promise of love. Genesis 3, verse 15, God looks at Satan and he says, And I, that is God, I will solve the problem. I will reveal my love in a sin-polluted world. And I will put enmity, separation, between you, Satan, and the woman. And between your offspring and hers. And he, that is the Messiah that will come, will crush the serpent's head. You will strike his heel. Jesus would come to Adam and to Eve. God said, love is going to come down. The Messiah is going to come. Yes, she'll be in a world of suffering. Yes, she'll be in a world of heartache. Yes, she'll be in a world of sorrow and disappointment. But love will come down. The Messiah will come. He will reveal love. Jesus will be born. Down the stream of time as a baby in Bethlehem's manger. He, Adam, will live the perfect life you should have lived. He, Adam, will die the death that the whole human race should die. He will hang on a cross and die. He will be resurrected from the grave. Christ will come. He will crush the head of the serpent. I will, Satan, before the whole universe, answer your challenge. You said God doesn't love? God will come down in the form of a baby, born in the womb of a woman. The book of Revelation describes this Christ that would come down. The book of Revelation describes this Jesus because it is the revelation of who, everybody? Jesus Christ. Who is this Christ of Revelation that answers Satan's challenge? Revelation reveals love's response. Who is this Christ of Revelation? Revelation 1, verse 5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Adam sinned and was guilty and deserved death. Every human being has followed the way of selfishness and not of love. But God in the Garden of Eden promised that love would triumph. And Jesus came and revealed that love on the cross. Nails were driven through his hands. And his tender flesh experienced strong-armed Roman soldiers driving nails to rip apart the flesh. And blood ran down his wrists and blood ran down his face. And Jesus on a cross called Calv in, on Calvary, on a hill called Golgotha, Jesus washed us with his own blood. He revealed, hanging between heaven and earth, the wisdom of God. He revealed there that God is a God of love. And the cross shouts to the whole universe that God's a God of love. The cross shouts to the whole universe, Satan, you're a liar. Every heavenly being could see it. Revelation, the 12th chapter and the 11th verse. Read it with me, please. How do we overcome the dragon? Here it is. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The dragon appears vicious. The dragon is a destroyer. The dragon is a deceiver. But there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. There, in the stream of time, a woman conceived a baby born of the Holy Spirit. Christ comes down. Nothing like this in Buddhism. Nothing like this in Shintoism. Nothing like this in Islam. Nothing like this in any religion in the world except Christianity. A loving God does not say, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and come where I am. But a loving God comes down to where we are because we cannot go to where he is until he comes to where we are. He comes as a baby. He faces Satan's temptations just like we must face them. He faces the evil one. He faces suffering. He faces sickness. It's all around him in society. He touches that sickness and men and women are healed. He comes to reveal love. Every time Jesus touches the eyes of the blind and they're unstopped. Every time he touches some withered man's arm and it heals. 
That's God saying, I love you and I want you to be healed from sickness. And one day in eternity when Christ comes, the universe will be healed. Every time Jesus breaks bread and feeds the 5,000, he is saying, I want every hungry boy or girl to have food. I love you. Every time he takes a baby in his arms that's dead and raises it to life, he's saying, one day sorrow will be gone and we will live forever. See, when you look at Christ, he is the answer to Satan's challenge. Does God love us? He sent his son, and when Jesus went to that cross and hung there, dying in the rain, it was Friday. Dark, dark Friday. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The Romans crucified him. The Jews rejected him. The disciples fled. It was Friday, dark, dark Friday. The clouds rolled in. It thundered. It lightning. The earth quaked beneath his feet. It was Friday. He hung on the cross with his head bowed. In the rain, he died on Friday. The birds stopped singing. The flowers drooped their heads. It was dark, dark Friday. But as they took him off that cross, holding him in their arms, his body was broken and bruised and bloody and battered. And they put him in the tomb and they sealed the tomb. And they said, it's over. What happened on that cross that Friday? Ephesians 3 verse 9, and to make all see the whole universe, what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. The mystery of the ages is how much God loves us. And that mystery, hidden through all the ages, is revealed on the cross. It's Friday. Dark, dark Friday. And they take that bloody body and they lay it in the tomb. And over Sabbath he sleeps. But hallelujah. Sunday morning, an angel descends. And that angel says, Son, thy father calleth thee. And the stone rolls away. And Christ comes out alive. Because you cannot keep the Son of God in the tomb. Where is God when I suffer? This Christ who suffered on a cross ascended to heaven. And the Bible says, Hebrews 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly or confidently to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus came and experienced loneliness and sorrow and suffering and heartache and pain and anguish, he understands whatever you go through tonight. And we can come confidently to his throne in a world of suffering and receive strength and grace in the midst of temptations that seem to be overwhelming. When indeed Satan moves in on you and the temptations are overwhelming and your whole being seems pulled to give in like Adam and Eve gave in to the evil one, there is a living Christ who moves into your life to drive back the forces of hell. There is a living, loving Christ that surrounds you. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Read it with me, please. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will do what? I will do what? Strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Satan was defeated on the cross. Satan's power over us was vanquished on the cross. God has his hand on Satan's grip 
and all of Satan's weapons cannot destroy you. Jesus says, I am your God. Be not dismayed. I will comfort you and I will strengthen you. Don't fear for I am with you. What are you going through tonight, brother? What are you going through tonight, sister? What heartache? What temptation is ripping you apart? Is it lust? Is it some desire for alcohol? You want to quit smoking, but you can't. Some young person on drugs. Some problem in your home. Christ is all-powerful. On the cross, he reveals the way of love. On the cross, he defeats Satan. On the cross, your sins are forgiven. But he's more than the Christ who dies. He is the Christ who is alive. And this Christ has power to change your life. This Christ has power to defeat Satan. Satan has no power. Why doesn't God do something about the suffering of the world? He did. He revealed his love on the cross and taps us on the shoulder and appeals to us to walk the way of love. Why doesn't Christ do something when I'm in trouble? He will. He is the living Christ. He'll move in and strengthen you to face whatever you need to face. He'll move in to give you power over Satan who wants to bind you. Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't Jesus do something about evil? He will yet do something. The book of Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 is the last chapter. If you don't understand the book of Revelation, you don't understand what's finally, fully, completely going to happen. Satan may seem to reign for a moment, but here's the last chapter, Revelation 20 verse 10. The devil who deceived them, he's the serpent, the deceiver Satan, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. The devil will finally be destroyed. Ezekiel 28, 18. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. Satan, finally, completely vanquished, defeated. The cross purchased our pardon. The cross revealed God's love. The cross revealed before the whole universe that God is love and one day Satan would finally completely be defeated. And one day, Ezekiel 28, verse 18, I turned you to ashes upon the earth. The book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel both say the same thing. Ezekiel 28, verse 19, you have become a horror, O oh Satan, and shall be no more forever. Satan defeated forever. Satan destroyed forever. Satan gone forever and forever. God's people rejoicing in the midst of love. Revelation 20 says that that holy city from God will come down and it calls it the camp of God's people, the city he loves. Love will reign in the universe. There will be no more war. There will be no more famines. There will be no more children with distended bellies. There will be no more hatred and greed and lust. God will reign forever and ever and ever in the universe because the city that God loves, the people that God loves will reign forever. The meek shall inherit the earth. Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. First Peter 3 verse 13. A new heavens and a new earth created. The city of God ultimately, finally, in the last chapters of Revelation, Satan gone. Earth recreated like the Garden of Eden again. And love reigns in the whole universe. Things worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. In the suffering of our life. God prompts us and reminds us that this earth is not our home, that he's leading us from here all the way to eternity. A number of years ago, when I was a young pastor, I used to teach a Bible class at a crippled children's hospital. And one of the leaders of that Bible class was a woman by the name of Joan Herman. Joan got polio when she was 17 years old. She described for me the first pain when she got polio. It was back in 1948. Polio epidemics 
swept through America. She had given her summer between her senior year in high school and her freshman year of college to go out and dig irrigation ditches for poor miners up in the Appalachian country. While she was there, one day she was in a ditch digging it and she felt a pain in her back. She had had the flu for a long time and she fell in the ditch. Her friends took her and laid her in a cabin. They took a door, she had so much pain, they took a door off its hinges and put it between two chairs and she laid on it. Soon it was diagnosed she had polio. She was paralyzed from her neck down, couldn't use her hands, couldn't use her feet. She'd brush her teeth, she couldn't brush her teeth, somebody would have to brush her teeth for her. Couldn't feed herself, somebody would have to feed her. Never could put on her own clothes, a nurse or an aide would have to do that. But during that trauma, she began to read the Bible. She asked a nurse to bring a Bible, put it above her. She'd turn the pages with her tongue. After about 20 years in an iron lung, she was the longest living American in an iron lung. She got cancer. Now imagine it, folk, polio from your neck down, paralyzed, living in an iron lung and developing cancer. Her life was ebbing away. She was in excruciating pain and she was dying. I visited her one day. We began to talk about eternity. We began to talk about heaven. And one of her favorite songs was a song that goes like this, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? All the way my Savior leads me. And she said, Mark, when I get to heaven and sin is no more, and we live in that glorious land of eternity, I will say that God knew everything about me all the way my Savior leads me. Whatever suffering you're going through in your home, whatever problems you face in your life, whatever difficulties you face, God revealed how much He loved you on a cross. The nails through his hands and the crown of thorns upon his head tells me that he loves you so much that you're so precious to him. Whatever pain or whatever suffering you're going through, this Christ reaches out to you tonight. He wants to heal your heart. He wants to give you power in your life and strength in your life tonight. And whatever suffering you're going through, whatever difficulty, whatever pain, like Joan Herman, that girl stricken with polio, that girl that got cancer was dying and ultimately died of cancer, you too can sing all the way my Savior leads me. Tonight, would you like to bow your head just momentarily and listen as Mary Lou sings that beautiful song, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Say, Jesus, thank you so much. Because I know that one day sin will be destroyed. One day Satan will be destroyed. One day in eternity, I will look back on my life and say, Lord, you were with me every step of the way. really speaks to our hearts all the way 
my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of his love, perfect rest to me he's promised in my Father's house above. Would you like to sing it with Mary Lou as your response to God? Let's stand together wherever you are tonight, throughout California, Arizona, Utah, across the Pacific Rim, wherever you are tonight, let's stand and sing it all the way my Savior leads me. ages. Jesus did what? He did what? Jesus led me all the way. He loves you. And when you stand there with him in eternity, you'll fall at his feet and say, Jesus, I see now that in every experience in life, you were there and you led me all the way. Let's pray. Father in heaven tonight, thank you that Satan is a defeated foe. Thank you that love has conquered selfishness, that love has overcome greed, that love has done away with pride. Thank you, Lord, that love is the strongest power in the universe. We yield to your love. We thank you for your love. Teach us today to sing the song that we'll sing through all eternity. Jesus, let us all the way. In Christ's name, amen. They have to face choices. And as they did, they did be influenced by the forces of light and the forces of darkness. The book is a bestseller. Thousands, millions of copies sold. Angels really have caught the attention of men and women throughout the United States and Canada. The book of Revelation is a book about angels. Angels play a prominent part in the book of Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, angels bring messages to the seven churches representing God's people and the struggles they go through in every age of earth's history. In the book of Revelation, angels seem to be flying from heaven to earth with God's last day message. Revelation 10, there is one angel that comes down from the glory of God in heaven, puts one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, and raises his hand and says there'll be time no longer. Angels in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, four angels hold back winds of strife. In Revelation 7 it says there's trouble coming from the north, trouble coming from the south, trouble coming from the east and the west, and angels stand there and hold back the winds of strife and destruction. In Revelation chapter 
14. Angels, three of them, fly swiftly to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Angels, miracles, and messages. Life magazine ran a cover feature article titled, The Trail of Angels. Billy Graham wrote a book, What About Angels? Another book, The Millennium of Deception, Angelic Deception Between the Forces of Light and the Forces of Darkness. Angels indeed are making a comeback. People seem fascinated by angels today. Guardian angels, good angels, evil angels. Go into any little gift shop and you'll notice there are angel pins, angel brooches, angel statues, angel icons. It seems that we're fascinated with angels. There's that famous blockbuster miniseries on CBS that's now running called what? Touched by an angel. Yes, interest in angels is exploding. Frank Peretti, a Christian author, wrote a book that really rocked the Christian world called The Present Darkness Piercing the Darkness. It was the story about a little town in which a family of four or five were the major characters. In this town, there was a battle between good and evil, the angels of light and the angels of darkness over this family. The book tells chapter by chapter how the father, mother, sisters and brothers would every day conflict on earth is because there was once conflict in heaven. And unless you understand this battle, this struggle, this conflict between angelic beings, you can never really make sense out of life and you can never make sense on what's going on around you unless you first understand what went on above you. You can never understand why there isn't peace on earth unless you understand why there was war in heaven. The Bible describes this amazing struggle, this incredible battle in the Revelation. Now this revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whose revelation is it again, everybody? It's the revelation of who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus. And Jesus gives us a magnificent revelation of a battle that began in heaven millenniums ago. Revelation, the 12th chapter and the 7th verse says, and war, read it with me please, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And war broke out where? Where did war break out, folks? Isn't that a strange place for war? You wouldn't think that war would break out in heaven. In two sides, two opposing sides, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. The world, their message leaps across language barriers. It penetrates every corner of the earth. It leaps across geographical boundaries and the three angels of the book of Revelation bring their message, God's message, to the ends of the earth in end time. Yes, angels play an important part in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, more than in any other book in the Bible, Revelation reveals an angelic struggle between good and evil. Revelation takes us back, back through the eons of time. Revelation takes us back into the ages of eternity. Revelation takes us back to the throne of God. And there at the throne of God in the book of Revelation, there is a titanic struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Revelation leads us back before creation, the creation of earth. It leads us back before the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars. It leads us back before the creation of the planetary heavens. It leads us back to the beginning when God created angels and then it describes as time goes on a titanic struggle between good, good and evil angels. It describes a Star Wars conflict, a cosmic conflict between good and evil. The reason why there is war on earth is because there was once war in heaven. 
The reason why there is... is Revelations, Star Wars, the battle behind the throne. Tonight we're going to sweep aside the curtain and see a cosmic conflict, a titanic struggle between good and evil. We live in the Los Angeles basin here. Our meetings are being satellited from the Sequoia Conference Center the border of Los Angeles County, but in the heart of Orange County. There's one thing about being from this area, and that is that many people come to Orange County, they come to the Los Angeles Basin because they want to make it big in TV. They have dreams of being stars, playing the lead role in feature films. Yet, there is something surprising that's taking place in the film industry. Angels are taking a leading role. Angels are making a comeback today, both in the film industry and throughout American society. You remember that movie not long ago? Angels in the Outfield. Who starred? Angels starred. Angels are the stars of movies. Angels are the stars of books. Here's a book, 